Hello, and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda. And we're your hosts. We're a traveling couple and digital nomads taking you on our adventures as we explore locations, destinations, and careers. Enjoy the show. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of the World Wanderers podcast. We are super excited that you're joining us for today's episode of the show. And this episode of the podcast is kind of like a part two from the last episode that came out. So if you heard the last episode of the podcast, it was with Amy Scott. It was a interview that I did on her podcast, Nomadtopia Radio. And this week on the podcast, we are interviewing Amy. And I'm super excited to get into this episode. Amy is originally from the United States and is currently based in central Mexico. Uh, Spoiler alert, she lives in the same city in Mexico that we do, and that's how we know her. She's been traveling and living abroad since 2004. She's passionate about helping entrepreneurs, freelancers, and remote workers harness the power of location independence to create freedom in their life and work. She's the founder of Nomadtopia, and she helps connect and support people around the globe who are building their own version of a location-independent lifestyle. And this is what she calls Nomadtopia, which I absolutely love. So in this episode of the show, Amy shares her travel story, what led her to take her first solo trip, and then set out as a digital nomad in 2007. She shares her journey since then, including living in Argentina, meeting her husband there, getting married, and eventually getting pregnant and having twins in Mexico. She talks about the decision to have babies abroad, why Mexico, what her experience was like, and so much more. So when Amy and I originally sat down to have the conversation that we did about having you know babies abroad on her podcast, we talked about how there just are not a lot of resources out there from people talking about the decision to go from being nomadic to maybe have a home base to getting pregnant to deciding where they're going to have their babies and then having them abroad. So hopefully this can act as kind of a part two resource to the episode that I did with her. Amy shares about having a baby abroad, but also just so much more. She's been a digital nomad and a traveler for so long now. So she's got a lot of great stuff to share and a lot of great resources over at her podcast and her website. So we'll give links for that a little bit later on. But for now, I hope you enjoy this episode with Amy. Welcome to the show today, Amy. We're really excited to have you here with us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun to have somebody that we know in real life on the show and we know where you're joining us from. Can you share with listeners where you're currently based? Yes. I am in Querétaro, Mexico. Yeah. So we know Amy because we live in the same city in Mexico. We met through mutual friends and mom's groups and birthday parties and stuff like that. And have also connected over mutual love of travel and also nomad life. So it's been really cool to get to know you and super stoked to hear more about your travels, your travel story, because I'm sure there's lots of things we haven't talked about off the episode. So let's get into it. Can you start by sharing, you know, kind of where your love of travel came from when you started traveling, all that good stuff? I was, um, you know, I moved around a bit, not like crazy, you know, military family style, but we moved a few times um, around the States when I was a kid. And then we took lots of road trips and had family all over the country. So there was definitely a lot of moving around and, and traveling and doing some family adventures. So that definitely kind of you know, planted the seed. And then I was traveling on my own um, as I got older. And then in my late twenties, I was on a weekend trip with some of my cousins who are about 10 years older than me. And they were like, but don't you really want to travel? And they meant like really travel. Like one of them had spent, you know, a few months in Thailand and they had done these kind of bigger adventures and they were kind of nudging me like, ah, maybe that'd be a good thing to do before you so-called settle down and they didn't say anything specific, but I got this crazy idea in my head. Like, okay, I want to take a round the world trip. Like I want to travel for like six months and, um, you know, quit my job and the whole thing. So I went home and told my boyfriend who I was living with at the time, like, here's this plan. I think we should do this. And like, I didn't even know that was a thing. I have no idea where I got the idea from. Uh, but long story short, that became something I was a hundred percent committed to doing. And I spent a couple of years planning and saving really primarily saving, uh, broke up with a boyfriend along the way and set off on a round the world trip by myself in 2004. And I basically have never looked back. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing to hear. 
were you nervous to travel by yourself? Were you excited to travel by yourself? Like, how are you feeling at that point? I had definitely shaped my itinerary, my, you know, my rough itinerary a little bit based on the fact that I would be traveling by myself and making sure that I was going to places that I thought I would feel comfortable. Um, but other than that, no, I don't think traveling by myself in particular felt like a, you know, something I was scared of or worried about. I think it was just kind of an overall, like I remember my friends in San Francisco where I've been living, they dropped me off at the airport for my flight to Peru. And I just like lost it in the drop off, you know, line at the airport. I was like, oh my God, like I am really doing this. What am I doing with my life? You know? And so I don't think it was anything specific at that point, but it was just like, it kind of hit me like, oh my God, I'm actually doing this. And okay, you know, here we go. Um, But it was an amazing experience. I had never traveled. I had actually, I don't think except for like a work trip or, you know, getting on a plane by myself to go visit a friend or something, I had never traveled by myself. So that was definitely jumping in the deep end, but um, yeah, it was an amazing experience and I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And so I'm curious, did you have plans to, you know, keep traveling or continue a life of travel or was it, I'm going to go do this year long trip. I'm going to come back. I'm going to, you know, get an adult job and carry on with life. I'm curious, like where your mindset was at at that point. Yeah. When I left, I had enough money saved that I, and kind of had a rough idea of how, you know, where I wanted to go and how long I wanted to spend there. And so I was thinking it would probably be about nine months. Um, I actually had an adult job. I worked at a publishing company as an editorial assistant and I was like, I full on quit. You know, I didn't ask for like a sabbatical or some, you know, unpaid time off or anything like that. I thought I quit. And I thought I had a sense like this trip could change things for me in a significant way, but I obviously had no idea what that was. And so I just wanted to leave things really open-ended, you know, didn't have a concrete plan for exactly how long it was going to last or what I would do after that. And then near the end of my trip, I obviously I was thinking about it on and off throughout those nine months and near the end of my trip. And this is something I highly recommend for people. I am so glad I had the wherewithal to do this. I spent about a week on a beach in Thailand and and like I kind of made like a solo retreat. Like I barely talked to anybody except to like order food. I was journaling and walking on the beach and just like, what just happened? You know, and like, what does this mean? What do I want? What's next? And I decided that I was going to start working for myself as a freelance editor because I already had those skills. I knew that was something I could do. And I definitely did not want it to be over. You know, I knew that I wanted to set things up so I would be able to continue doing things like this. And I already knew it was kind of ahead of the curve in the sense that like we, I had a freelance, um, editor that I hired when I worked at the publishing company, she lived in Costa Rica and edited books for us, you know, and like emailed files back and forth. So this is back in, you know, 2003, 2004. And I already knew that was a thing that that was possible, um, particularly in my line of work. So that was what I did. I went home, I bought a laptop and, you know, set myself up to be able to, um, you know, over time support myself with that work. So I would be able to go anywhere and, you know, work from anywhere. And so that enabled me to move to Argentina uh, in 2007. And it's just been, yeah, just kind of been continuing the adventure in different forms since then. Yeah, I'd love to to talk for a moment about like what it was like when you started the trip. So you arrive in Peru, kind of the start of this big nine month to a year to maybe a lifetime adventure. Uh, What was that? Like, what were the first few days, the first few weeks of the trip like? I had set things up. So I had, and this again, in hindsight, it's probably a good idea. And I don't remember if it was how intentional it was, but my very first stop was a Spanish immersion program in Cusco. And so I think I had one night in Lima and then I got on a plane I think it was a plane. I don't even remember how I got there. I think I flew um, to Cusco. And then I was there 
I think the program I signed up for was like three or four weeks. So, you know, staying with a family, Spanish classes every day. And so that gave me some structure right off the bat. And naturally I was meeting other travelers in um, at the Spanish school and they organized, you know, events and outings and all of this. And so that was a really great starting point. And also just having the support of the local family, like they helped me figure out like how to take the bus downtown to school and, you know, all of these things that was kind of a nice, uh, soft landing in a way. Um, and then I spent some more time in that part of Peru on my own and then started continuing South from there. So it was, yeah, it was a really, it really kind of smooth transition, I think, because I didn't just land and like, oh my gosh, now what, you know, I had something to do right away. So that helped, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and a great tip for anyone who's listening who might be planning solo travel, like having something where you're in a setting where you can meet other travelers, other like-minded people, and also like get to learn the language. Because I think one of the things that's most uncomfortable about traveling internationally is you arrive somewhere and the culture is different, but the language is different, right? And if you don't speak it, it feels like this barrier to kind of connect with people on on a human level. And it can feel scary when you can't get your basic needs met in the language that that they speak there. So I think that's a great idea that you did that. Yeah, I have been studying. So my the boyfriend I mentioned earlier was Mexican American. And so I had studied, started uh, learning Spanish living in San Francisco. I was taking, you know, classes at a community college. So I had a little bit of a basis, but um, obviously the Spanish immersion just took things to a whole other level. And you're right. Then I felt much more confident launching off on my own from there. Of course, no one um, prepares you, even if they tell you this fact, like you don't know until you're doing it yourself, how significant the difference can be between Spanish and different countries. You know, you're like, oh, look at all these, you know, contiguous Spanish countries, Spanish speaking countries and, you know, accents and just kind of manner of speech and vocabulary, like so varied that I constantly feel like I'm learning Spanish all over again, even now. Yeah, we can relate to that so much. Like you get like this idea of, oh, like so many countries, so many people speak this language. This is going to be great, which I think is true of many big languages. Like if you studied English in um, Scotland and then you went to America, you'd be like, what's happening here? Um, but yeah, I remember we were going back and forth between like Chile and Argentina and we'd done a couple of weeks of language school in Buenos Aires and we're like, hey, we're conversational. Like we can have a conversation a little bit now. And then get to Chile and it's like, I can't even get into like the men's washroom because like, I don't know what the words mean. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. And, and what I wanted to ask Amy was, so I know you ended up deciding like, hey, I want to move to Argentina once you started doing that, like, you know, the digital nomad life basically or freelancing from abroad. Um, did you go to Argentina on the first trip? And what was it about that experience that kind of made you think like, okay, this is the place I want to go back to? Yes, I did go to Argentina on the first trip. I spent quite a bit of time, you know, like obviously I started in Peru and then um, spent quite a bit of time going south from there through Bolivia, through Chile, all the way down to Patagonia and then back up basically through Argentina and ended uh, that leg of the trip in Buenos Aires. And I really liked BA. The city is amazing, as you know, you've been there. Um, I was there... I actually don't remember how long I was there long enough to get a feel for it and know that I really would love to spend more time there. And when, as I said, when I was coming to the end of my trip and I was feeling like, I know I want to continue this in some way. And one of the ideas that I had was to be able to go and stay somewhere for longer and have, you know, just a really more full-fledged, you know, deeper cultural experience. And, but I actually had three places on my list that I had been, uh, well, and I had some criteria too. I wanted to go somewhere that I could speak the language, you know, ish, as we were just talking about, um, somewhere that I would feel comfortable, you know, being there alone and, um, oh, and lower cost of living. Cause you know, I was still working on building my freelance income and all of that. I think those were my main criteria. So I had um, Arequipa in Peru, Valparaiso in Chile, and Buenos Aires. 
And obviously those are very different places. And I just kind of, you know, thought back on my experience in each place and imagine what it would be like to be there, how comfortable I would feel. And a big part of it was feeling like I being alone and this being my first, you know, more extended overseas adventure, I wanted to be somewhere that I wouldn't stand out so much. Obviously being tall and blonde, I stand out a lot like in Peru and Bolivia. <laughs> um in Valparaiso at that time, I wasn't 100% sure I would feel safe there. Um, so that's more or less how I landed on BA. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And so you said you went, you moved to Argentina in 2007. So there's kind of a couple of years in there. Were you back in the US working on, you know, building your business or what were you doing for that that period of time? Yeah, I was back in the US for about... I think it was about two and a half years and uh, which, oh gosh, it felt endless. Like I was so ready to go. Like the whole time I was like, I don't want to be here really. Um, But I was also, I had kind of set some landmarks for myself in terms of, you know, kind of consistency of income, building some savings back up. You know, I'm not one of those people who's like, ah, forget it. I'm just going to get on a plane with 500 bucks or something. Like I really wanted to have, you know, a solid foundation. So I first lived in LA where um, a different boyfriend I was dating at that time lived. That didn't work out, both the city and the guy. And so then I moved back to the East Coast. I basically, I just kind of, yeah, I bounced around. um, I bounced around a bit in the US and just kind of trying to, you know, keep expenses down and, um, and work on building my freelance business until I felt like I was ready to go. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I feel like you're like a lifetime nomad. That's like what I'm getting from your story is just like been nomadic since the the start of life. Um, but one thing I want to, I want to ask you, cause I feel like this is one thing that we get asked a lot and can be really challenging for people is like, how do you know when you're ready? Like, can you talk through some of the criteria that you had in terms of, you know, savings goals and just knowing like, Hey, I've got enough clients because we're very much the same as you like leaving, the country with only $500 in my bank account. Like the thought of that makes me feel quite anxious. Like I like to be a little bit more planned and ready, but at the same time, it's like you could spend your whole life trying to get ready. So at some point you need to take that leap. So I'm curious if you can kind of talk us through your experience there. Yes, that is so true. And yeah, I, you know, that's something I work with people on. I'm constantly help, like, I want to help people find that balance, right? Like feel confident that you're well enough prepared, but don't constantly be finding new excuses and new reasons why it's not time yet. And it is tricky to find that that sweet spot. For me, I think in most cases, well, not always. I can think of a few where that was not the case. Generally, you know, like the two times we have been talking about with um, heading off on my round the world trip and then moving to Argentina, I had fairly specific um, savings goals that I wanted to reach before I, you know, I felt like I was ready. And once that was in place, I think I like, you know, I was so committed to taking the leap that for me, that felt like a good enough um, kind of trigger point. Like, okay, I, the money's there, or I could tell, you know, I'm on track and the money is going to be there by whatever time ready to buy a plane ticket, et cetera. And, um, but there have been times, like I remember, so I ended up, this is a whole other uh, era that we have not gotten into yet, but I ended up meeting my husband in Argentina. He is from there. And he was immediately intrigued by this whole location independent nomad thing. He was like, wait, what? Like, how did you get here? What are you doing? Like, can I do that too? <laughs> like, how, where do I sign up? And so from the time we met, basically, that was something that was on his radar and our radar as a couple. And just a few months after we got married in 2012, we hit the road. And that time, to be honest, I don't think we were perhaps as well prepared financially as we should have been. You know, we just spent money on a wedding and and other things. Um, but it again, it just felt like a significant milestone. And you know, he he had he had solid savings, probably better than I did at that point, that he felt like he was ready to quit his job and go all in. Um, but we did hit a stretch. Um, about a year later where I was like, oh, I don't know if this is quite working. <laughs> like we gotta, we gotta, you know, 
get this finance thing back under control. Um, but it's so sometimes I guess I would say to sum all that up, sometimes it's been kind of a more um emotional thing or just feeling like the time is right and we're ready to do it. And um yeah, other times the financial piece has been really significant. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's really helpful. And yeah, so let's kind of get into that chapter in Argentina. So you moved down to Argentina, you're by yourself. You know, How long was it before you ended up meeting your husband? It was about uh, two, two and a half years. I, and that's the other thing is I moved there on a tourist visa thinking, I don't know, maybe six months, maybe a year, just kind of see how it goes. I did not have a concrete plan for how long it was going to be there. I just, you know, was going to play it by ear. And then I just loved it. I was having a fabulous time, met so many amazing people. Um, I was really active in the couch surfing community there and met a ton of locals and, you know, people who were either there kind of on extended um, trips or like me, I actually met some other people who were also working online or working remotely. And next thing you know, it had been like two years and I was just starting to think like, well, I mean, I could be anywhere, like maybe it's time to go somewhere else and was planting the seeds to do that and thinking because I was on a tourist visa still, I always booked trips from the U.S. round trip to Argentina. So then I'd be able to show that I was leaving. Um, And so I already had a trip booked and I, you know, back to the States and I was thinking maybe that will be the last one. Like maybe I'll just, you know, do that return flight and not come back. And literally right around that same time, I went to a salsa club with some friends and that's where I met Roberto. (laughs) Um, And then I did take that trip, but I came back. Um, You know, we hit it off right away and I definitely felt like, I think I need to stick around and see where this is going to go. And so that was, we met in late 2009 um, and got married in early 2012. Amazing. And were you living in Buenos Aires the entire time? Did you move around Argentina a little bit? I did a little bit. Um, I think after about six months, I don't remember why um, at that particular time or why the particular location, but I decided to go to Mendoza, um, which for people don't, who don't know, that's a uh, wine country closer to the Andes. And I was there... A few months, I think. I actually don't remember for sure. And I really liked Mendoza too. Um, and yeah, it's funny to think about. I'm, I don't remember exactly why I decided that that, like I'd been there long enough or whatever. Um, I think, yeah, I was there a few months and then I went back to BA. So I traveled around a bit, but in terms of actually living somewhere, like I got an apartment, like the whole thing, um, those are the only two places. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mendoza is great. So I feel like it's a good choice for sure in Argentina. And so you, yeah, you get married and then you and Roberto decide like, Hey, let's do this digital nomad life thing. Now. Um, I know you mentioned that, you know, a year in money felt a little bit tricky and challenging, but I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about like, I guess the shift to maybe traveling a bit more again, and then also traveling like as a couple versus solo traveling? Yeah, it was surprisingly smooth. Um, You know, we had talked quite a bit about, well, and we had taken some short trips together, you know, either back to the States to visit my family, some trips um, in Argentina. And we were always talking about kind of our travel styles. And I shared, you know, how I had traveled in the past and, and just kind of what it can look like. And then obviously talking about like, okay, what kinds of places do we want to go? And like, how long do we want to spend in one place? And how is work going to work? And all of these different pieces. So we, in terms of preparation, like if we did not necessarily have like, you know, the budget (laughs) sorted out, I do think we had a sense of, um, yeah, just how we wanted it to look. And yeah, we, we've just... I don't know. We're a good fit for traveling together. Um, lucky, <laughs> lucky enough. And that was, yeah. So that piece of it um, really was pretty smooth. And we spent most of our time um, 
Actually, that's not true. We went to the U.S. first. We actually spent six months in the U.S., um, kind of touring around. There were tons of places that I wanted to show him, um, you know, uh, seeing friends and family. And then we went to Southeast Asia. And that was where um, we spent a significant amount of time in that first year or so. Yeah, that's awesome. Southeast Asia is such a good place for for nomad life and just for travel in general. Yes. And I'm curious at what point, I guess, like family planning and then also Mexico comes into the picture for you guys. It was really funny. We were in Chiang Mai. So as I said, we spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia and um, we went to India. Actually, my family came and met us in India. So that was an interesting mix of like, you know, tourism and travel with people who are on vacation and then like also trying to be like working online. Um, but yeah, so we've been in that part of the world for a long time. And at one point we were in Chiang Mai and hoofing it across the city in, you know, like the hottest time of year, the hottest time of the day to go to this Mexican restaurant. And, you know, as would be expected, like it was fine. <laughs> And I was like, why are we doing this? Like, why don't we just go to the source? Why don't we just go to Mexico? I love Mexican food. Why haven't we been to Mexico yet? And I had been here, you know, on like I'd been to Tijuana, I'd been to Cancun, I'd been to Tulum, um, but not spent any significant time here, just little U.S. vacation things. And so we came here for the first time in 2014. And it's funny, the two have kind of happened hand in hand. Like we would leave Argentina and then go back and then leave and then go back. And like, we would go for shorter and shorter times uh, back to Argentina and kind of sim simultaneously, the opposite was having happening with Mexico. Like we first came for a month and then we left for a while. And then we came back for like four months and then we left again. And then we came back for like six months and it just kept getting longer and longer. Um, and we were, yeah, we were really enjoying it here. Um, the family piece of it, we first started talking about that, well, in terms of, you know, actually seriously moving in that direction, probably around that same time, like 2014-ish. Um, and actually, I found a naturopath in San Miguel de Allende, who was from the States and, you know, talked to him about, you know, just kind of fertility stuff. And I started this journey a little bit on the late side, <laughs> so to speak. And so I just, you know, we wanted to see kind of where we were at. And so I was doing like acupuncture and all of the, you know, taking supplements and so on. And so having that support um, while we were traveling was really great. And then, cause we would, you know, again, we would kind of go for a while and then come back. And so we could check in with him. And, um, also this was at the height of some of the Zika madness. Um, I guess that was a little bit later. That was like 2016, I think. And so that also started to shape our travel because I still was not pregnant, but we were still trying. And that was a big concern for people who are pregnant and, that ended up narrowing us more and more to the central highlands of Mexico. The altitude is higher. And so uh, the mosquitoes, there are mosquitoes, as you guys know, but um, not as much of a concern for Zika, uh, something to do with the altitude, like those mosquitoes don't survive at this height or something. Um, so yeah, long story short, we ended up spending most of our time between San Miguel de Allende and the Mexico City where our kids were born, spoiler alert. and. Um, and now here in Querétaro. Yeah, amazing. And I want to dive more into the the baby stuff. But before we were just, as you were talking about Mexican food in Asia, we looked at each other. I need to ask, is the restaurant you went to in Chiang Mai Salsa Kitchen? Oh, gosh. Do, do you remember? I don't. That doesn't ring a bell. Okay. <laughs> um, But I can, it was like right by, um, it was on a pretty major road. And there was like, it was a kind of open air. Like, I think we were under, you know, some kind of roof, but if we were like outside, um, although that kind of describes a lot of places there, I guess. <laughs> we'll have to look it up and see if it's the same place. Yeah, offline, I'm super curious. We just had like this. <laughs> so we were in Asia, like starting our nomad journey in like 2016, 2017. And one thing that kind of led us to Mexico is very similar. We would just find ourselves like 
seeking out the Mexican restaurants, going and eating there. Often they were quite good, but I mean, nothing's as good as like being at the source. Right. So yeah, we were in Shanghai in China for five days. We got like the 72 hour visa exemption or whatever, if you just stay in the city. And I think we went to this Mexican restaurant. We found like two or three times. <laughs> it was just so good. <laughs> and finally, after that, we were like, what are we doing? Let's go to Mexico. So anyways, it was just really relating to that, that part of your part of your story. Yeah, I'm sure we're not alone in being drawn to Mexico for the food. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, that's one of one of the greatest things about this country, among many things, but it, their food is definitely something great. And so one thing I'm curious about is like, you know, you're from the US, your husband's from Argentina. You know, obviously there's lots of factors, but what was the conversation like in terms of like where do we want to have a baby? Like, did you guys talk about going to Argentina or going to the US or you know, how did Mexico become sort of the choice you guys ended up with? Mm-hmm. We definitely talked about all of those options um, and more <laughs> and just trying to figure out, um, yeah, it, it was kind of a mix of like, you know, what, what do we need? Like, what are we looking for in that kind of location, um, you know, in terms of support and also, you know, costs and, um, I, I mean, I think I would have been open to Argentina, but I didn't have any particular reason to, you know, go back to Argentina for that. And also the States, um, like I didn't have any kind of insurance that would have covered, um, maternity and, and birth there. And so that would have been a whole other piece of the puzzle trying to figure out how to do that. And Roberto only has a, a tourist visa for the States and, you know, so on. And another piece that we really started to look at was, and I don't know how, probably just, you know, like from my podcast and interviewing people and knowing other nomads, I knew that there were, oh, actually, I know I had a friend in Argentina who is her, she and her husband were American and they had a kid in Argentina and they got permanent residency because their son was born there. So that was like probably around 2010 or something that that was on my radar like, oh, interesting. Some countries, that's a thing. And so that was definitely something we talked about because thanks to marrying Roberto, I already had residency in Argentina. So that wasn't, didn't feel necessary. Um, And we were also spending less and less time there. So it didn't seem particularly important. And then, and of course he can transfer because he's from there. Right. So we started looking at other places that would give you residency or citizenship um, by having a baby there. And notably, there are a handful of countries in Latin America in particular, I don't know why, um, that have those kinds of rules in place. Um, The biggies that people talk about the most are Mexico and Costa Rica. Um, I believe Panama is one, um, Nicaragua. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, But yeah, so long story short, Costa Rica and Mexico were on our radar very early because of that. And I knew people who had had children in both of those places. So then as we spent more and more time here, I think it just became kind of a no-brainer that this um, would be the place. Um, But Amanda, as you and I talked about when I interviewed you for my podcast, that not knowing when that was actually going to you know, when that countdown was going to start. I mean, it took me five years uh, to get pregnant. So that was definitely a challenging piece of like, we basically knew what we wanted to do and where we wanted to do it. And it was just like, but when, like we had no idea and it really shaped a lot of um, advanced planning that we did not feel like we could do uh, during that time period. So that was tricky. Like there were some, you know, events and conferences and what have you that we ended up missing because I'm like, well, I might be pregnant then. And then I wasn't. (laughs) So that's a bummer, but you know, we were constantly um, planning around that. So that was, that was a tricky, a tricky phase for sure. And you guys were in Mexico city for most of that time. Um, let me think. No, it was, it was a mix because we moved to Mexico city in early, no late 2017. Wait, is that right? I think I'm getting my years mixed up. Yeah, I, was I say, think... we were we were in Mexico City in late 2017. <laughs> okay, well, we were definitely there at the same time then. Um, oh, I love it because <laughs> it was either early or late 2017. I don't remember for sure. I'm getting. I think I'm getting my years mixed up a little bit. No, I, yes, it was October 
2017. Okay. So, um, but we started trying ish like sometime in 2014. So that was when we first started going to San Miguel. So there were some phases, um, like we were, oh, we spent some time in other parts of Central America. Like we went to, um, Nicaragua for a couple months. We went to Costa Rica for a while. Um, and then back up to Mexico, we were back and forth, you know, to Argentina, to the U S to Canada, to visit friends. Um, we did go to Bangkok, um, for a conference, um, but cut the trip super short because Zika had just become, they'd just been added to the list of Zika countries. (laughs) So yeah, it was constantly just trying to like balance all these different things. Um, and then slowly more and more spending time in San Miguel and then, uh, moved to Mexico city and, um, our twins were born there in 2019. Awesome. Yeah. And I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Like once you guys do get pregnant, um, was there any pushback from family members when they figure out like, wait, you're not coming home uh, to have a baby? And then, yeah, what was it like figuring out or finding out that you guys were going to have twins? Uh, yeah. Um, we were pretty lucky. I feel like, um, we, I don't think anyone was surprised that, well, I think mostly people were just surprised, like, oh, wait, like you're having kids. Like, I think, you know, we got married late, so, you know, quote unquote, and then, you know, took so long to get pregnant that I think people probably just assumed we weren't having kids. Like, oh, they're, you know, they're travelers and like that probably decided that's not their thing. So I think just that news alone <laughs> was a surprise to people. But, um, because I had been gone so long and um, I don't think there was any expectation or like pressure to go back to the States or even to go to Argentina. But um, there were definitely some people who were surprised, like, well, but is it safe? You know, <laughs> like people have a lot of misconceptions about other countries, obviously. And there were people who are like, I mean, why would you not come back to the U.S.? You know, I think especially my parents told me they were hearing this from some of their friends. Um, Like, well, they're going to have she's going to give birth here. Right. Um, And yeah, I think even my parents who have been, you know, very supportive and open minded and they've traveled a lot themselves. I think they maybe had some reservations that they didn't share with us until um, my mom came down while I was pregnant. And it happened that I had a, one of my prenatal appointments while she was here. And so I invited her to come with me and meet my doctor and, you know, see the hospital. And, and then, she, and I think that really put her mind at ease. And she's like, oh, wow, this is like super nice. This is like more modern than the States, you know, like, I don't know what everyone is so worried about. So that, I think that went a long way too. Yeah. I feel like that's one of the biggest misconceptions, like particularly about Mexico. I think we can speak to that too, because that was also our experience, but yeah, I think it's, I think we definitely had people that were kind of the same way, like, Oh wait, you're not going to give birth in Canada. Like, why would you not give birth here? And then when they find out, you know, how amazing the private medical system is here, it's like, Oh, okay. Well, it's like actually better than Canada. So why would we not do it here? You know? So yeah, it's uh, definitely had a similar experience. And then, yeah, I would love to hear that piece about the twins as well. Like what it's like having an ultrasound and then being like, oh, there's not one baby in there. There's two. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot to wrap our heads around. Um, it felt like it would have a much more significant impact on our lifestyle <laughs> than just having one. Uh And we, and it actually shifted a lot of our feelings about the birth plan too, because um, like a lot of places, and I'm sure you guys know all this too, there's, you know, a very high rate of C-sections here. And when I thought I was having one, um, or even before I was pregnant, you know, we were looking at um, birthing centers and, you know, midwives and doulas and all of these things, thinking that that would be the best way. to ensure being able to have a natural birth if at all possible. And um, then when we found out it was twins and I'm in my early forties by this point, and I, I felt like mm, maybe it would be good just in case 
to be in a place with more medical support. Um, but I did a lot of research about, um, you know, hospitals that and doctors in particular that are, um, they call it humanized birth here, humani- uh, parto humanizado. And so I, I figured that out somehow Googling. And then I, you know, was looking specifically for places um, and doctors that I thought would support that. And um, we kind of got the best of both worlds because we were in a hospital which had, you know, NICU and, you know, all the stuff, um, but also birthing pools in the rooms and, you know, like no rules about, you know, you have to do it a certain way, really. So that um, was really amazing. And my doctor, you know, I don't have anything to compare it with, but based on what I've heard from some other people, I get the sense that with my doctor, I had a really positive experience that she was not constantly like, you know, walking on eggshells like, oh my God, you know, in your forties with twins, like this is so high risk and high everything. Like, you know, we can't do this or we can't do that or we have to do this. And she supported um, my goals all the way through. We hired a doula. We also worked with a um, another woman who specializes in twins. And um, yeah, they were super supportive and constantly. And we just went to the doctor yesterday and I'm talking about my son and the doctor's like, oh, so a cesarean, right? And I said, nope. And he was like, what? Like everyone just assumes like, well, you had twins, it must be cesarean. Um, but we made it happen. So that was super exciting. Yeah, I'm a huge advocate for natural birth. So I just feel really happy that you were able to have that experience and that everything worked out well. And I totally get, you know, we went the route of of having a midwife and stuff like that because I was very, very aligned with you in terms of I don't want somebody who's just going to say like, hey, okay, cesarean really quick. But, you know, having twins being a bit older, I totally get the desire to be somewhere that in case something does happen, you've got access to that. Because obviously, you know, living in in the world we do now is a huge blessing in terms of having access to that type of medical care. So it's amazing that you were able to have that, that experience that was quite balanced, it sounds like. You had everything you needed in case something went wrong, but also somebody to support your goals. And one thing I'd love to talk about is, you know, how things have shifted for you guys since having, you know, not one baby, but two babies, you know, how has, you know, life looked, how has nomad life looked? And obviously we're going to mix a a global pandemic in there too, just for fun. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It has been a roller coaster. I, in the early months, I definitely had times I was like, what I done like this, like, you know, obviously life will never be the same, but it was like times 10. Cause I was just like, oh my gosh, how do you do this with two? And just constantly feeling like, um, how do we ever find our, you know, ourselves again, let alone like our travel legs. And, you know, it just felt so overwhelming and far away at that point. And the funny thing is I've been thinking about this recently that In a way, the pandemic was a blessing in disguise for us because, so the twins were nine months in March, 2020. Uh, We were living in an apartment in Mexico City. And we actually, we had a trip booked to Argentina for that month that we canceled two days before. So we were just on the verge of like, okay, you know, like first big trip, you know, like this is happening. We're going to figure this out and take them to meet Roberto's family and all that. Um, So that didn't happen, which was devastating. But at the same time, looking back, I think that it gave us kind of an excuse to, well, yeah, (laughs) it's basically an excuse and a, a, you know, forced grounding that took the pressure off of mostly the pressure I was putting on myself, right? About like, but we're nomads, we're travelers. Like we have to get out there. Just being like, well, that's not a thing right now. And so let me just like catch my breath and, you know, take care of these kids and like figure out, you know, who they are and what they need before we try to add this whole other piece to the puzzle. Um, So there are definitely times I felt very impatient and, you know, not so grateful for it. But looking back, I think that was actually kind of a good thing that we could just, you know, kind of be um, and not feel like we had to do 
a lot of travel right away. You know, I definitely like a lot of us, especially when I thought I was having one, I was like, oh yeah, you know, like first two years they fly free. Like we got to go everywhere and do everything. And um, they didn't even get on a plane until after they turned two. So, you know, that did not go the way we planned, but again, just, yeah, not having the pressure to do that because like, well, it's just not possible right now, or we don't feel comfortable doing that right now. So um, we finally did take that trip to Argentina earlier this year though. And that was really great. Yeah. And so now you guys have been in Mexico for quite a while. I know you've been based here in Querétaro for a bit. Um, are you thinking like you'd like to return to a more travel heavy nomadic style life? Are you guys feeling like, Hey, we want to keep our base here for the foreseeable future or, or where, um, does that stuff stand? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, I think probably the way that we've been leaning for oh, most of this time since, um, since they were born or even before is the idea that we would have a base and maybe take, you know, a handful of extended trips throughout the year. Um, at one point I had the idea of like, oh, we could go to like, you know, go to Argentina in the fall or yeah, spring there. Right. Which is fall here. And then, um, vice versa for the States and then like go somewhere else during the summer. I don't know. Like I had all these ideas, but then, um, we, I don't think it will be something that, uh, structured per se, but yeah, the idea of, you know, having a base and traveling from there is definitely feels more appealing. One of the big pieces that is on our minds right now and it still feels early. And yeah, I know it's not at all, um, is school. And we had always assumed that like, well, yeah, duh, we homeschool because then, you know, we're still location independent. We can do what we want. But once there's actual people involved, <laughs> like, Hmm, you know, how would that be? And we've spent so much time obviously at home, um, taking care of them the past few years and just trying to figure out what would that actually look like on a practical level? And are we prepared to do that. Like there's so many things that I love about it, but it also feels incredibly daunting. And like, how does one possibly like do that and get work done, you know, and all of these other things that we need and want to do. So that feels like it's definitely going to play a role in, in what, you know, what the coming years look like, because school is definitely a factor one way or another. Um, even so, I think even if we were homeschooling, we might be looking at a, you know, a base plus travel scenario. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I know it's hard to kind of, you know, talk through those decisions when you don't know what it's going to be like. And I think one thing, you know, our our little girl is still super small, but just even having eight months with her, it's like they change so much. And yeah, you just, I think as they're growing, it's like, you kind of have to be really adaptable to what they need in that moment, which when you're trying to plan travel out in advance can be so hard to do. Right. Because it's just, it's just a lot to balance. So I think we're, we're on the same page, like have a base and then do some travel from there. And it keeps a little bit of stability, stability for all of us. Cause I don't know, travel is so much more exhausting when you add kids to the mix. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we've taken just a couple short trips, you know, um, like locally here in Mexico, like car trips. And we actually came back early one time. I'm like, oh, my God, this, we were a terrible travelers. Like, what has happened? But like the Airbnb was such a miserable setup for us that the second day we looked at each other and we were like, why don't we just go home? <laughs> like, we're going to get a better night's sleep. Like everyone's going to be more chill. Like, I think I would be more relaxed at home right now. Let's just go home and take a break. <laughs> Do you know what's funny is we've actually done that twice. I think, I don't know if the circumstances were the same, but one time is we traveled to get Lou's Mexican passport and we were like, we'll just make a weekend of it. And the passport ended up being super quick and we were able to go to a little Pueblo Magico nearby. And then we were like, well, it's like the afternoon. We could just drive home and sleep in our own bed instead of like sleeping in this hotel bed and then driving home tomorrow. And then we have a whole day at home tomorrow. So we ended up doing that, which is just not how we were like pre-baby. And then the second one was Ryan got stung by a scorpion and we were so sketched out staying in this Airbnb because we had the baby with us. We're like, we don't want her to get stung by a scorpion and like make another trip to the hospital. So we were like, we're driving back to Kidetro. This is not going well. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, it's crazy how how it really can shift your your um, priorities. <laughs> yeah, I know 100%. And so one thing I'd love to hear a little bit about before we wrap up is your podcast, um, the collective you have, your business that you've created, all of that good stuff. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I have a podcast uh, called Nomadtopia Radio. And I interview, it's a lot like this, really. I interview, you know, other nomads and travelers and um, just to be able to share lots of different stories and perspectives. And Nomadtopia um, as a brand is also the home of, so it's nomadtopia.com is my website. And then um, I have an online community that I run as well called the Nomadtopia Collective, where people come together and connect with others who are doing the same thing. It can be really lonely and um, difficult when you don't have support and you don't know anyone else who's doing this kind of thing. And so having a place that you can come and get support and ans- ask questions and get resources uh, is super important. So that's what the collective is for. <laughs> Amazing. Can you share links for all of that so that we can uh, we can we can share that with listeners and we'll obviously put them in the show notes as well? Yes. Uh, so you can find Nomadtopia Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, nomadtopia.com is the main site. And from there, there's links to um, the podcast um, and the blog and, and the community, the collective. And um, there's also a free guide that you can get there as well to help you prepare for your version of Nomadtopia. Awesome. Well, definitely go check that out, everyone. And Amy, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. Lou says thank you as well. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want more, make sure to check out The World Wanderers Insider, available on Patreon at patreon.com slash theworldwanderers. For show notes, head over to theworldwanderers.com. Find us on social media at The World Wanderers Podcast and join the private Facebook community at World Wanderers, a community for travelers. You can always get in touch with us at info at theworldwanderers.com. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It really helps us find new listeners. See you next time.